people are joining little by little. And by the way, this um, multicolored photograph is kind of what happens when mast cells are triggered. They shoot out all these cytokines, which are immune regulators. Um, they're full of these little granules. And when they're stimulated, they, these little granules are shot out. So I thought it was an appropriate uh, photograph to use for mast cell activation syndrome. Um, All right, mast cell activation syndrome and um, how they are affected by mycotoxin immunoglobulin E antibodies as triggers. Um, let's get started. And let me take you through a couple of things first. I want to put the references instead of at the very end, like I'm many times, many people do it, I've done it, etc. I want to put it in front because you'll see here Dr. Theo Haridis, Dr. Afrin, uh, again, Dr. Theo Haridis, um, and there's a group, and I'm very honored and fortunate to know these these doctors uh including dr weinstock we are in the process of writing an article about this to be published in a in a medical journal so i wanted to put this in the front we've also submitted another article on mast cell activation syndrome uh dr Weinst uh, uh, dr weinstock who is from the uh, Washington University School of Medicine, Department of Gastroenterology uh, in, um, in Missouri. Um, this is what I do, I'm, and this is part of what I do. Part of what I do is I'm the editor in chief and all these things of many, many, of several medical journals. These are all peer reviewed. Um, and since we're here, I wanna, uh, mentioned to people that there are two types of journals. There's peer-reviewed journals, which, which are accepted in medicine and science. They're listed in uh, the National Library of Medicine, pubmed.gov. And also uh, the other part is that there are journals that are called predator journals. These have impressive names, but basically what you do, you get in touch with them. You say, I want you to publish this article. How much will it cost? They'll tell you how much it costs. Nobody will review it, et cetera, it goes out. However, none of those predator journals are accepted in medicine and science. It's basically junk science and junk medicine. Um, I was last Thursday, this past Thursday, I was, I just want to pass this on. I was honored by my university medical school uh, for my work and research since I graduated. So don't even ask how long ago, but it was a long time ago. They gave me this beautiful gold medal and had a lovely, lovely ceremony. This was Thursday of last week. Um, what are the objectives tonight? Understand what is the evidence in medical science on mycotoxins and mast cells, not the internet um, uh, BS. Understand how mycotoxin antibodies can trigger mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS. Understand what lacks medical and scientific evidence regarding the testing and the treatment of mycotoxin and mast cell activation. So, the keys to solving medical problems 
caused by toxins, but believe me, it's not only by toxins, is number one, detect the cause. Number two, remove the cause. Number three, repair the damage. Unfortunately, in medicine, not only in this country, but many other countries, medicine has involved into treating symptoms with a, a prescription drug. Oh, you have headaches? Here's a pill for headaches. You, you, you can't sleep at night? Here's a sleeping pill. Um, you, all these, instead of looking for the cause. So this is what I advocate whenever I give courses and also whenever I teach. Before the pandemic, I taught at Oxford in the summer and Harvard Medical School to the faculty, because that's when the students are gone. Anyway, detect, remove, repair, and the patient is cured. You don't need to keep treating and treating. So why are we having issues about molds and mycotoxins? A lot of it is due to my climate change, unexpected weather in most areas of the planet. We saw how rivers dried up in Europe how there's incredible heat in California, all kinds of problems, then hurricanes, flood, rising waters, and of course, disasters, damage, and health hazards, because when mold infests, you get mold infested homes, schools, businesses, and public buildings. This is according to indoor air pollution, and uh, also by the World Health Organization. So molds, indoor mold spores induce a persistent change in, in persistent changes in inflammatory and immune responses. Okay. And chronic exposure to indoor molds induce chronic inflammation, and inflammation leads to all these diseases. Okay. So molds multiply quickly, and as they multiply, they release mold spores that carry mycotoxins. So two important points, a mold that produces mycotoxins doesn't produce one mycotoxin. It produces several mycotoxins. And then the other part of that, if a mold is known to produce mycotoxins, and it, you, it's found in a home, inside a building, a home, whatever, then the mycotoxins it produces are present as well. So, and then this has been going on for a long time, but people haven't realized it. They think it's new. Spores of toxigenic fungi contain mycotoxins, and mycotoxins associated with spores are likely to be absorbed by the, the respiratory epithelium and translocated other sites, sites producing systemic effects. Look how old these are. Well over 30 years old, okay? So having said that, let's look at size because size is very important. Hair, your hair, human hair, 100 microns thick. Mold spores, two to four microns. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1. So exposure to mycotoxins is mainly by inhalation, dermal absorption, ingestion. The ingestion part is minimal. What is the important part of this slide? Mycotoxins are 0 0.1 microns. They're the same size as a virus. Everybody has heard about viruses in the last two, three years. It's in so, do you, by the way, do you test for viruses? Have you ever heard of a test for viruses via urine? No. You can make your own conclusion. How are viruses tested for? Hepatitis virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, etc. They're all tested by antibody testing, not urine. Just like my micro lab does antibody testing for mycotoxins. Okay, so um, what do these mycotoxins do? They're very potent protein synthesis inhibitors. 
they inhibit you from absorbing protein. So if you go tomorrow night and eat a whole tomahawk or tomorrow morning have a dozen eggs for breakfast, well, very little of that protein is going to benefit you. It inhibits the synthesis of RNA and DNA and it forms DNA addicts and protein addicts. Anytime you mess with DNA, you're looking at a carcinogenic issue. It causes a lot of oxidative stress. It causes a cell death because of mitochondria. It dysregulates the mitochondria and the cell therefore dies. Apoptosis is another word for cell death, actually program cell death. Mycotoxin antibodies bind to human tissue and trigger an autoimmune disorder. So that tells you a little bit more about these. Um, hang on. The overwhelming medical and scientific evidence shows that it is the, the brain and nervous tissue that mycotoxins first affect. And then mycotoxin antibodies bind to human tissue, including neural tissue in the brain, such as myelin, and triggers demyelination. So let's talk about mast cells. Mast cells are the important cells of the immune system. And what they do is they, um, they do several things, including they, they, they affect and regulate the immune system. And they're all over, they're widely distributed in the body. And they contribute to a lot of processes that the immune system has to take care of, including defense, growth, healing. And they play a, a very important role in the inflammatory process. And there's an exaggerated response to mass, uh, of the mast cells to a trigger. One such trigger is an IgE antibody to mycotoxins which leads to uncontrolled inflammation and resulting symptoms. Though, and this is, I think, quite interesting, but the mast cells don't increase. It's the same number. They stay the same. They don't increase, although they're, they're doing all this stuff. And you don't find mast cells in the circulation. However, when they are stimulated, they release mediators. Um, that affect the immune system and the body, tryptase, histamine, heparin, certain prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Um, and mast cells can cause many disorders. They're known to cause fibromyalgia, okay? So um, and the important part about there is get treat the, the, the mast cell stimulation, you get rid of the fibromyalgia instead of treating the fibromyalgia. Um, mast cells are, are, are around in most tissues. They typically surround blood vessels and nerves, especially prominent there, and they are especially prominent near the boundary between the outside and the internal environment, such as the skin, mucosa, the lungs, digestive tract, as well as the mouth, the conjunctivas of the eye, and nasal passages. They're the mast cells are the immune gate to the brain. They naturally occur in the brain where they interact with the neuroimmune system. In the brain, mast cells are located in a number of structures that mediate visceral, meaning gut, sensory, usually pain, or neuroendocrine functions, including the pituitary stalk, um, pineal gland, thalamus, and hypothalamus, choroid plexus, and the dural layer um, of, of the meninges in the brain. And we come to mast cell activation syndrome. <clears throat> the mast cells activated by molds and their mycotoxin cause irritation of the respiratory tract, the eyes cause recurrent sinusitis, bronchitis, cough, 
neurological manifestations, including fatigue, brain fog, headaches, and this leads then to mast cell activation syndrome. I want to mention gliotoxin because gliotoxin is a known factor that causes mast cell activation syndrome. And gliotoxin is a mycotoxin that really affects the brain a lot. So folks, because many of you may not read the medical literature, beware of glutathione because on the internet there's all this give this give that give the other give glutathione well if a patient has elevated antibodies to gliotoxin glutathione will increase the toxicity of gliotoxin so be careful um mast cells when they're activated trigger by certain stimuli, such as IgE antibodies to mycotoxins, they release these cytokines. Cytokines regulate the immune system, tell it what to do. And these include IL-6 um, and, and uh, IL-17, uh, TNF, and several others. As an example, extensive antibiotic use, as in Lyme disease, can trigger MCAS and bring about intestinal permeability, leaky gut, visceral sensitivity, meaning gut pain, and gastrointestinal motility problems. So MCAS symptoms may include rashes, hives, flushing, itching, and the itching may, may be there without with or without rashes, bloating, reflux, nausea, diarrhea, low blood pressure, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, headaches, brain fog, anxiety, fatigue, weight loss, weakness, dizziness, and many, many others. I have a questionnaire I can facilitate to you and send it to you via email if you just send me shoot me an email, I'll send it to you. So let's just take one of these factors because we really can't take all of them. Otherwise, it's, an, it's a four-hour course. Interleukin-6, it's a multifunctional cytokine that regulates immune response, inflammation, homeopoiesis, and the acute response by the immune system. It has a very important role in the development of autoimmune diseases. It re it's released by mast cells when stimulated by IgE mycotoxin antibodies. So, um, which mycotoxins cause the re release of IL-6? There's nine of them. Um, and these nine are listed here. And what they, um, these are all the tests um, that, that my micro lab do. This is nine out of the 12 microtoxins um, uh, that um, uh, my micro lab tests for. So let's take ochrotoxin, really sig significantly increases IL 6, it suppresses. NAC and STL system cysteine. Um, it increase increases you to uh, sorry to get to uh, develop rheumatoid arthritis, and it causes a lot of inflammation in the nasal mucosa, which means you're going to have a lot of sinusitis. Alternaria increases the secretion of IL six and damages. DNA. T2 toxin significantly elevates IL-6 and increases TNF-alpha, uh, another inflammatory cytokine. Satotoxin. It increases and potentiates the pro-inflammatory cytokine production, IL-6. 
it magnifies the innate immune inflammatory response. Deoxynivalenol, uh, also known as Don, like the um, first name of the previous pre president, we won't go there, uh, significantly increase LL6 production and affects bronchial cells directly. What do you get when that happens? You get a lot of wheezing, chest tightness, chronic kind of a cough, etc. cetera. Um, and so when that happens, um, you have all these respiratory issues. So this is a study that was done last year. And, and of course, this is published. I'm an evidence-based doctor. I don't believe in anecdotes, you know, oh, use this binder because it really helps patients. Okay, if it does, where's the evidence? Where's the medical and scientific evidence? Well, it's helped a lot of my patients. Okay, that's anecdote. Okay. So almost 149, 140 patients, 139. Uh, not quite. Uh, half and half, 78 were female, 61 were, were male. Skin problems in 71%. Half had gastrointestinal problems. A third had cardiovascular problems, musculoskeletal problems. A quarter had fatigue issues and had sexual impairment. So what were the symptoms that were noted in the participants of this study, flushing, itching, low blood pressure, gastrointestinal issues, irritability, headaches, the sexual impairment, concentration problems, memory loss, neuropsychiatric issues and problems. Then let's look at a different study autism and mast cell activation. Another study showed that in autism spectrum disorder, there's a 10, there's an increase 10 times the more in children as compared in ma with mastocytosis compared to the general population. So if a, any child that has mastocytosis is 10 times more likely to be, have ASD. One third of the patients with mastocytosis complained of neuropsychological symptoms, such as fatigue, cognitive impairment, depression. Anyway, so you see where I, I discussed with, showed you before how it's in the brain. Well, the brain gets affected. Here's a case study of mine uh, before that happened with MCAS before, and then I'll show you the after. This is a 28 year old and uh, is a female with visible mold in the home. Um, it's in the kitchen area. V before she was very active, she did um, worked out in the gym. She had an active social life with her friends until about three months ago, and the skin issues started. And she didn't want to go out mainly because she felt that these these skin things, uh, you know, people would stop her and said, "What's that you have?" Or, or you know, people talk and all that. So she saw different dermatologists who gave her either creams or, or, or steroid, corticosteroid tablets. And after one month, she quit everything. She said they, that steroids affected her, she couldn't sleep, and, and had a lot of other side effects. What were her main symptoms? Fatigue, nausea, before eating, not eating, after eating, it didn't matter. She was nauseated, itching, flushing, and a lot of gastrointestinal complaints. Here's some pictures. And these lesions that you see migrate. They move around. They don't stay static. 
And she had a lot of different kinds. I went, I, I saw her on different days, and on different days they looked different. This was on the same day. Then this was her My Micro Lab test results. Look at, on the right. The right is the IgE antibodies. You see how they are? They're almost all of all of them are positive to a certain extent extent. And she also has IgE, which indicates um, a toxic reaction, but most of it is over here on the right. And this is her neck before and after. You see her wrist is also clear. And this was on a separate day when I went, or when I saw her. Um, and this was her back. She had it not only on her back, but other areas as well. And her leg, she had it on both legs. And this is after treatment. And this is her antibodies after treatment. Uh, excuse me, here. So six months later, this is all normal. There's one left here on the IgE gene. She also took, got rid, she also moved out actually of the house she was living in and went to live at her mom's place. So it doesn't take that long, but here you go. And let me take you back before and a few months later. So you can follow these patients and use the test to measure the success. I want, to under, want people to understand antibodies because a lot of people apply toxicology to microbiology. There's, in microbiology, there's four pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and parasites. And whenever we get sick from these <coughs> or are exposed, we develop IgG antibodies. Now, all these four are living organisms and they have cell walls. The antibodies to these mean past exposure. Toxins are not alive and do not have cell walls. They're inert. I mean, let's take mercury. It's just molecules. So antibodies to toxins indicate a current immune reaction or and or colonization. Not you had this sometime in the past and it's still there. No. And as I just showed you, once the toxins are gone from the body, the antibody reaction fades away. So this is where we have this reaction, antibody reaction, and this is what happens afterwards. And again, these are all toxins. So let's talk about treatment. First and foremost, and this is the most difficult part, the first rule of toxicology, get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient, okay? If they are continuously exposed or exposed even for just an hour or two a day, they will not improve. So instead of going through a whole the whole treatment, I'm asking you to watch my webinar on treatment that I gave, I think it was just a month ago. So if you go to mymicrolab.com and at the top, click on video, and then you see treatment, autism, brain part one and two, and other webinars that I've given. Treatment happens to be the four on the top row, the fourth one from the left. So let me bring out something else that people are confused about. Low levels of mycotoxins are found in many foods, cereals, beans, fruits, grape juice, beer, coffee. Coffee is a bean also, etc. And this has been well known. It's 
follow the WHO publishes World Health Organization, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. They all publish this data. And for that reason, mycotoxins can be found in the urine in parts per billion in healthy people. So plant-based foods, meats, uh, dairy, dairy products, uh, they can contain mycotoxins. But th in th this particular case, when they can make you sick, these are in countries that lack implementa any implementation of adequate food safety policies. Where does this occur? Mainly in rural parts of uh, certain African countries where after the harvest, they're poorly stored and get moldy. And in rural China, after harvesting, uh, and it's poorly stored. And this is pretty much in, in the eastern section of China. So, so food mycotoxins are really not a concern. Why? Because the amount of mycotoxins in, in, in industrialized countries, Western countries, et cetera, in numerous studies are shown to be below what is called the TDI, tolerable daily intake. It's set by the FDA in the United States. In Europe, it's the EFSA, the Euro UN Food and Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization, Organization Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives. So that's why we, we pee it out, we excrete it. Urine is an excretion. The only thing that we might test in urine is sh sugar, but even that is just a vague test. So last year, Frey and his uh, group showed that, there, that in 91%, of all cow's milk had mycotoxins anywhere from one to four. 91 had at least 1%, but 91% had at least one mycotoxins and 30% had two to four mycotoxins. However, all the mycotoxins levels were below tolerable daily intake and ex easily excreted in urine as are most mycotoxins found in beverages and in foods. So that doesn't mean you can't use dairy products. No, it's, it's, very, it's so tiny, it doesn't affect our health. And let me explain parts per billion. And I ask this from a, physical, a, phys um, a physicist. I told him I was a visual and I can't understand what a part per billion is. He says, take a hundred football fields, cover them with golf balls, remove one golf ball, that's a part per billion. So when foods and beverages have five, three, seven parts per billion, these are easily excreted. It doesn't affect or hurt your body. And that's been shown in many, many published studies. So don't, don't worry about urine mycotoxins. It doesn't tell you anything. And according to Dr. Rajdani, these are points to be considered before deciding to use urine level mycotoxins as an indication of exposure to mold inside a building, a home, a business, a school, uh, where, a library, wherever you happen to be. First question is, what is the source of mycotoxins detected in urine? You think because we breathe in these things, they're the same size as a virus that we're going to be um, affected? No, we're not. Second thing is why is the detection of mycotoxins in the urine not an indication of new antigen formation between mycotoxins and human tissue antigens that play a role in pathophysiology? of autoimmune and neuroimmune diseases, because you can't measure those things. It's inaccurate. And this is because the mycotoxins that are detected in urine 
originate from food. And it's not an indication of body burden and shouldn't be used as a biomarker for mycotoxins and a water damaged building. So having said that, let's look at binders because they're so popular on the internet. Oh, use this binder for this mycotoxin, that binder. And my thing is, sure, sure, okay, you believe, if you believe that, show me the medical evidence. Show me the medical and scientific study that says this is so. It's like saying, um, uh, un my uncle Ralph was bald, and then he rubbed uh, walnut oil on his uh, uh, bald head for a month, and his hair grew back out. Well, I'm very happy for Uncle Ralph, but where's the medical evidence? That mean I'm going to give it to all my patients? Oh, and sell it in a, in a little vial for only $50? No. So they studied binders in pigs, rabbits, sheep, ducks, turkeys, broiler chickens, rats, mice. And in the laboratory, which is a very controlled environment, specific binders may remove mycotoxins under certain precise conditions in a laboratory for these animals. There are no published studies about this in the peer-reviewed medical literature. As I told you in the beginning, there's peer-reviewed medical journals and then there's predator journals. In the predator journals, they'll publish anything you pay them to publish. So um, in the issues that we constantly see um, on the internet is all this kind of uh, things that are trying to convince people. So here's two emails I got from patients. Here's one patient who said, <clears throat> I've been dealing with mold toxicity and trying to get to the bottom of everything because I'm not getting any better. I was blown away by your thoughts on binders because they're pushed by pretty much everyone. And I've been taking them and haven't seen much of a difference. Another one said, my functional doctor uses Shoemaker's protocol, which most of them use. It didn't work for me, unfortunately. That's why I found your article and contacted you. After two and a half years of her doctor trying to heal my gut, I'm not satisfied with the prior treatment. The previous experienced doctor that I was seeing for the mycotoxins for about two years who was very knowledgeable in mold illness, only treated me with cholestyramine and VIP, the modified shoemaker protocol, as well as some supplements. Did it work? No. And by the way, I've been, by early next year, I'll have reached 15,000 patients that I've treated. Right now, it's still in the 14,000 range. Over 30 years, that's a lot of patients. And it takes me approximately six months to get them well. So if your patients are not getting well in about six months, it's because there's something wrong in your treatment protocol. Um, and by the way, binders interfere with these medications. How about some, a, a female who's taken estrogen and progesterone? Oh, well, then you, you, you take the binder, um, and, and you, you take, you, you leave several hours between then and the medication. Wonderful. Show me the evidence. Show me that there should be this many hours, as you say, of difference. What study has been done to show that's the best amount of time to wait? There are none, okay? Thyroid medication. What about diabetics who take an oral diabetic drug? I mean, it makes no sense, but anyway. Sham tests, Neuroquant is essentially a test for brain atrophy, okay? It's great for brain trauma, or Alzheimer's disease, if you want to use it. SPECT, 
single photon emission computerized tomography is much more useful in clinical medicine. Um, I've known Dr. Daniel Amen for decades. He's the world's expert on this. Even Canada, which has a socialized medical system, have accepted Dr. Amen's diagnostic method methods. Marcons, that's just another fairy tale. There's no evidence in medicine or science that supports Marcon's diagnosis and treatment. And yes, I gave my patient and I treated it for this and they got better. Well, let me tell you, you know, that's placebo and that's anecdote. It's not real medicine and not real science. Um, the, there's, there's a lot out there, such as melatonin and all these. Here's another one, the HLA test. And it's supposed to affect 25% of the population, meaning about 82.5 million Americans have this genetic issue. But there isn't a single published study relating this to any HLA test, to anything to do with molds and mycotoxins. There's no research, it's not being taught in any medical institution and has no basis in medical science. Remember this number, 82 and a half million Americans. Now let's, let's take another disease that affects 34 million Americans, about 50 million less. It's called diabetes. Everybody's heard about it, but no one's heard of the HLA, but it affects 82 two and a half million Americans. Well, that's what you get when you publish in these predator journals. They'll publish anything as long as you pay them enough money. The organic acid test measures the levels of organic compounds in urine. Okay. It's, it's a test used to check in, in newborns, rare inborn genetic defects of metabolism in newborns. It is in medicine and in science, it is not used for any kind of mold marker. That's a useless fairy tale test. If you think that it's real, let me ask you, look it up. Look it up in, in peer reviewed, med go to the National Library of Medicine, pubmed.gov. Type in organic acid test and see if there's any connection to mold. So if you want more information, email me at immunedoctor at gmail.com. If you want the questionnaire I mentioned before, and this latest paper was published in March of this year with um, Dr. Weinstock of uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, mold, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions. I'll be happy to send it to you or any other. Um, I've published over 100 studies that, you know, anything that you would like, I can send it to you. So having said that, for the treatment part, because that's lengthy, it's not a 20-minute thing. It's not binders, cholestyramine, and supplements or, or, or herbs or something. It, you can find it. It's on the, if you click on, if you go to mymicrolab.com, click on the top there, it says video, and it'll open up all the videos and, and webinars I've done. And right at the very top in the first few on the very top there's the one on treatment and it works for these patients I've, I've showed you the before and after it's very common if you should have patients that you think may have mcas and you want to ask me questions please feel free to do so i can help guide you and the one of the really important parts is that you've got to make sure um, uh, that number one, it, it makes sure you do a good review of systems or systems review, thorough 
with the patient that you suspect. Okay. Now, I gave you symptoms, general symptoms, like I gave you headaches. But there's all kinds of headaches. And most of the headaches these the MCAS causes or mast cell activation is unusual for that person. Everybody's had a headache. We all have had a headache. But all of a sudden, these are different type of headache for these folks. I get a headache once in a blue moon. But some people relate, well, I don't get a whole, it's only on one side, it's right here kind of thing. Or it's, it feels like it's fire, like my brain's on fire. I have a couple of questions. Is the oat test useful for anything else other than rare inborn genetic defects of metabolism? It's not a validated test, and it, the only time you use it in medicine is when there's a newborn uh, that's having a, a, a metabolic issue and the test, and it's, and it's a quick test, you get the results quickly, okay? And if anyone has any other questions, please let me know. Again, the key components of treatment are in my treatment webinar, and all you gotta do is go to mymicrolab.com, click on video, and you'll see it, it's at the top row. And because it would, it, that itself was an hour long uh, uh, webinar. I can't do both. As you see, um, uh, if you, I also have, a, um, I published a study uh, uh, on Lyme and mycotoxins, how to tell between one or the other. Um, how long, the question here, how long do antibodies stay positive after exposure to mycotoxins? Well, as long as, it, 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 as long as it's in your body. To explain to you this way, it is how much you have in your body, okay? It's, it's what is called, there, there's two basic types of tests. One is a qualitative test, like a pregnancy test. Do you or do you not? And the other is a quantitative test, such as this one. It tells you how much is in your body, or in medicine, we call that the body burden. As long as they are in your body, the, anti the antibodies will show up in your blood test. When they're gone, as I showed in the, um, during this program, you saw the before and you saw the after. Once they're gone from the body, once you've treated it the right way, they're gone. So once you start treatment, I tell folks, retest in six months, not before. Wait, you start treatment January 1st. I'm just giving an example. Wait six months and then repeat the test. Um, are there any other questions? Um, um, thank you, Dr. Singh, for your kind words. I appreciate you and uh, very, very much. Great doctor, Dr. Singh. Um, anyway, this is the real science, the real medicine. I'm asked about the ERMI tests. Let me um, get out a screen sharing, but well, no, I can't do that. Send me an email. The email, the ERMI test is a very misunderstood test and should not be used to determine if there's molds in an indoor environment. So if you would please email me at, um, and you see my email address, I'll send you the real truth. One is um, from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency of the Federal Government, and the other is an actual public uh, publication. It's not a, it's very popular, yes, but it's not helpful. 
it's very imprecise and the the actually the government who first thought about it is regrets having ever thought about it so um any other questions that i'll be happy to answer and i'll be happy to stay here as long as you like And if there are no other messages, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. And be well, everybody. Um, someone is asking me, can I suggest a doctor? Sure, just uh, email me and we'll, we'll find one. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I thank you. I thank you very much for being here with me. I can't wait for the next one, and uh, which will be next month in October, and we'll let you all know. And um, have a great rest of your week, and God bless you all.